thank you all for finding your way here to the Ed Auditorium um, to be with us for the next hour. I know that the weather has been less than cooperative and I really thought that we were well into spring and suddenly it's winter again, so perhaps it's the last blast. So I am so privileged to be able to welcome Dr. Patty Lader to Treaty 4 today, the traditional territory of the Cree, Soto, and Assiniboine peoples, and to the University of Regina and the Faculty of Education. Dr. Lader's talk is titled Against Proper Objects, Toward the Diversity, Toward the Diversely Qualitative, and I for one cannot wait to hear what she has to say. But first I want to provide a bit of an introduction. So Dr. Patty Lather is Emeritus Professor, or Professor Emeritus, we decided it could be either, <laughs> in the School of Educational Policy and Leadership at Ohio State University, having just retired from her position this past September. And she tells me that she is enjoying this new chapter of her life. Since joining OSU in 1988, she has taught qualitative research, feminist methodology, and gender and education. She is the author of four award-winning books, Getting Smart, Feminist Research and Pedagogy, Within the Postmodern in 1991, Troubling the Angels, Women Living with HIV AIDS, uh, co-authored with Chris Smithies in 1998, Getting Lost, Feminist Efforts Toward a Double Science in 2008, and Engaging in Social Science, and these are all award-winning books. She's also published numerous articles in peer-reviewed journals, including one that was um, life-changing for me as I worked toward my master's degree in 1996 at the University of British Columbia. The article was titled Research as Praxis, published in Harvard Educational Review, um, and it was one of the very first articles I read in my research methods class, and it really changed the way that I thought about research. I had a very traditional understanding of what research was and might be, and it generated very robust discussions of the nature, purpose, and possibilities of empirical research in educational settings. So thank you for that gift. Dr. Baker has lectured widely in international and national contexts and held a number of distinguished visiting lectureships. Her work examines various post-critical feminist and post-structural theories, most recently with a focus on the implications for qualitative inquiry of the call for scientifically based research in education. She's held visiting positions at the University of British Columbia, at Göteborg University, York University, and the Danish Pedagogy Institute, and in 2009 she was an inductee of the American Educational Research Association's Fellows, which is a, quite a prestigious honor and most deserving. So I just have a little um, anecdote that I want to share before I turn it over to Dr. Lather. In 2005, I had the opportunity to attend AERA in Montreal at the time, and I had circled and starred a session in my calendar um, that included Dr. Lather. And it was a retrospective on um, decades of feminist scholarship in education. And the panelists included uh, Dr. Deborah Ritzman, Dr. Elizabeth Ellsworth, Dr. Janet Miller, Dr. Elizabeth St. Pierre, and Dr. Patty Lather. It was like going to a rock concert with all the biggest names, and you wanted to have your light, your lighter out and going. Um, so when I arrived at the hotel to find where the session was going to be located, um, it was not in the main ballroom, as you might imagine, with that kind of panel. In fact, it was in the basement. Do you remember this? Kind down, of. Down the hallway. They usually put me in very small rooms. Yeah, it was a very, very small room. And um, kind of ironic, I think. You know, a retrospective on feminist scholarship over 30 years, this all-star panel, and there it was in the basement. You had to really look for the room. Um, I got there early. It was already packed and overflowing. And, uh, but meanwhile, upstairs in the grand ballroom, there was a parallel session featuring, you know, a single white male scholar. And, uh, <laughs> but what I was struck by was how um, gracious and um, just accommodating the panelists were, including Dr. Lather, exhibiting uh, humor under the circumstances. And we all recognized the irony of the situation and the challenges of the space as people literally spilled out the door, down the hallway, and around the corner. Um, but these women did not miss a beat, and I still actually have my notes from the session. I found them the other day, each speaker, so, you know, I'll share them with you later. Yeah, you were the first. <laughs> so anyway, it is my great pleasure to uh, turn it over to Dr. Patty Lather. Thank you for being here with us this afternoon. Thank you. How's the voice? In the back, okay. 
I thought Patrick was going to make all you people move down front, but that's all right. So I'm going to make it here. Again. <laughs> Thanks to everybody who worked to get me here. I'm pleased to be here, uh, whether or not, doesn't matter to me. Um, I want to uh, make a few introductory remarks and then sort of launch into it. And I'll go on for some time and then hopefully uh, in about 40 minutes I'll just stop and then we'll have some time for Q&A. So as I'm talking, do be thinking about the kinds of questions you might want to ask. Before I start though, I'd like to know who I'm talking to. So how many undergraduates? How many master's students? Ooh. How many doctoral students? How many faculty members? Hey, uh, how many full-time teachers? Welcome all. <laughs> Anybody whose category I did not call? In the back there, what are you? <laughs> Independent researchers. Hey, okay. <laughs> well, anyway, welcome to everybody. And uh, I'm going to talk about how I see qualitative research in the present moment. And I'm going to begin somewhere in there. There'll be a series of maps that I've made of it over the years. And I'm going to begin with three, I guess you could call them framing caveats. I will be following Foucault. I always, I'm a very Foucaultian person. I, I use Foucault because I think as much as anybody I've read, he helps me understand how concepts are not born ready-made. They emerge out of history. And he helps me see that in everything I do. To see the framings I use to frame things. It's kind of a meta thing that I think he does so well. Uh, he also helps me increase the circumference of the seeable, which is one of his gifts. And, or another way to say it is that I think he helps we fish see the water that we swim in. Uh, so I'm hoping as I talk here, the Foucaultian genealogy part of what I want to address will make itself present. The second caveat is that I'll be working out of what Rosie Bredotti calls the feminist post-post. And in a minute here, I'll do some of these framing charts and graphs of mine, so that may make more sense. There's the this, and then there was the post this, and now we've got the post-post this. So things just keep moving. And I'm very interested in this post-post that sometimes gets called the new materialism, or post-humanism is another term that gets bandied about quite a bit. So that too will be weaving its way through my remarks today. And finally, I'll be um, charting things that are always on the move. So whatever I've got to say today is already outdated in a way, because there's proliferations and migrations and circulations, moving, moving, moving. In, what, in my remarks, I'll begin with a kind of memoir that will track my own um, intellectual development, I guess you could say, in order to uh, move into a, a carefully curated set of empirical examples. I like to think of myself sometimes as a narrator of methodology. I, I was trained in literary criticism as, a, as an undergraduate and a master's student. So I, I read social science like I do literature, and then sort of position myself as a literary critic, I guess you could say. And in my methodology work then, I narrate the, the, the methodology that people are using. So I'm always in the market for what I see as sort of cutting edge methodological exemplars that I can then extract and name their practices and begin to get a feel for the edges of, of what's, uh, what's developing in the field. So let me begin with this memoir part of things. What ushered me into my own thinking? I was a feminist before I was a Marxist, and that has made all the difference. This came about through some combination of life experience and teaching high school where I merged fully into feminism in small town Indiana. And I'll let you think about that a minute. <laughs> Stepping out on the feminist stage intellectually for the first time 
I integrated women's literature and especially history into my teaching in a combined two-hour block called American Studies. So I had these kids for two hours every day. Those were the days when an individually teacher-designed curriculum was quite welcome. And I spent many an hour at the mimeograph machine. Some of you may not even know what that is. <laughs> and the typewriter. Some of you may not know what that is either. The, and the, type, the mimeograph machine and the typewriter. These were heady times that reinforced feminism in my high school teaching as well as in my life. After an amazing opportunity to spend six weeks in Nigeria with a mixed race group of 20 other Indiana school teachers, I decided on doctoral work, although I did not know one end of a doctoral program from another. I chose something called general secondary education. After failing my entry into social studies education, not enough of a researcher, I was told. Hmm. <laughs> Which at that time meant I had no knowledge of or interest in statistics, hmm. or research for that matter, whatever that meant. The general secondary education faculty was comprised of former superintendents that I could never seem to find in their offices. So I looked around for another program, landing in something called curriculum. I didn't know what that meant either. Largely because those guys, and they were all guys, were there and quite friendly. They also ran an alternative teacher education program, which was a good match for my hippie leanings. This is like late 70s. While being called an organic Marxist when I was an early doctoral student was one of the best compliments of my life, I did not know what it meant until I began to learn from other doctoral students what critical social thought was all about. I could not rely on my professors, and you doctor students should be listening to this. I could not rely on my professors for knowing, for being conversant with sort of the cutting edges of the field. At that time was the work of Henry Giroux, Michael Apple, etc. But my fellow doctoral students introduced me to these critical education theorists, as well as queer theory, which was just starting to pop at the time, a la Bill Pinar which was also not a part of my formal graduate training. And I don't mean to put your professors down, I just think there's the formal graduate curriculum and then there's the, the informal that you learn from your peers and, quite frankly, going to conferences. Um, what I did get more formally was women's studies and that too has made all the difference. I was among the cohort at Indiana University that was the first to take advantage of a brand new PhD minor in women's studies. I also benefited immeasurably from being on the committee to organize the annual National Women's Studies Conference that introduced me to feminist philosophy of science, which was huge uh, for me. Nothing was ever the same again. This feminist work on science, now called feminist science studies, combined, combined with another stroke of luck during my Indiana University years, Egon Guga was G-U-B-A, was offering the first qualitative research courses. What good timing on my part. Between Guba and feminist science studies, I was saved from positivism, as I thought about it at the time. And I converted accordingly, gratefully. Maybe I could be an educational researcher after all. This then was my academic training, including importantly the women's studies minor that Egon Guba recommended against. You'll never get a job, he told me. No one will ever hire you with, with that on your record. I remember Guba asking me how I got so smart, and my answer was something about the combination of women's studies and qualitative research, uh, and how they interrupted one another. They just didn't. They said different things, and they, they contradicted each other. And it was working in the contradiction between those two discourses that I think really sharpened my critical skills. Um, my advisor, Norm Overly, took me to the Bergamo Curriculum Theorizing Conference, the fall of 1981. And there I began to see a life for myself as a critical feminist scholar. Bergamo was like dying and going to heaven. Critical theorists, phenomenologists, feminists, queers, race conscious white folks with a very sparse scattering of folks of color. There were even Canadians, <laughs> including Deborah Britzman, 
who then as now helped me entertain the idea of a psychoanalysis I could bear to learn from. Because as a feminist, I've been taught to hate psychoanalysis. Um, and it was at Bergamo, somewhere in the mid-80s, that I was introduced to the posties. First through Jacques Daigneault, a French-Canadian who spoke Derrida. You know this guy? I had no idea what he was talking about. But after some years of critical theory, it seemed like a breath of fresh air. I first described this as the difference between being hit, hit over the head with neo-Marxist theory, you will think this way about that, um, versus being tickled into awareness by the serious playfulness of French posty theory. While by no means an easy read, post-structuralism was so much less heavy-handed and moralistically directed and so much more in tune with my emerging sense that critical theory had its limits in making sense of what was rushing down the road. Crit media culture, post-colonialities, and the blurring of disciplines way beyond the sort of interdisciplinarity of American studies, which I got my master's in. I, f I had found my own way to be uncomfortable with issues of imposition and emancipatory work paralleling feminist discomforts, as well as challenging some of feminism's own blind spots. Especially attractive to me was the postmodern repositioning of critical intellectuals away from either universal spokespeople, and that's Foucault, or academic heroes, cultural workers, and toward opening up our privileged spaces in the production of a politics of difference that recognizes paradox, complicity, and complexity. I began my academic career in Mankato, Minnesota, women's studies program, so much for Guba's advice. <laughs> if I hadn't had that women's studies minor, I never would have got a job out of college, out of graduate school. Teaching a course on feminism and postmodern thought was very helpful in moving me toward the post. As we ask questions like, how can liberatory intentions become part of what Foucault terms master discourses? How can feminist thought and practice escape totalism, dogmatism? I was a very dogmatic feminist when I first started teaching. I wanted to produce little copies of myself. I thought that was successful teaching. They'll all become feminists just like me. Who are all these French white guys anyway? And why should a group of praxis-oriented feminists care? After coming out of the gate with a rush around using feminist critical theory to rethink qualitative methods, especially issues of validity, and I'm pretty sure that came from Guba, because Guba and Lincoln, at, at that time it was just Guba, were very important in helping qualitative researchers legitimize what they were doing by coming up with practices of validity, discourse practices of validity, so that when the positivists had internal whatever it's called, we had this. They had generalization, we had that. We had member checks, we had uh, different kinds of uh, validity that were appropriate to qualitative research methods. I so anyway, after coming out of the gate, ready to use feminist critical theory to rethink qualitative methods, especially issues of validity, I proceeded to not write, and that not is all in capital letters. I couldn't write after I got introduced to post-structuralism. Everything fell apart for me. And I was on the tenure track, you know. I, I didn't exactly have a lot of time to not write. But it took me about two years. I just read and read and read and slowly began to try to write again. Everything was different. I hardly recognized myself in this new space of a less authoritarian sort of knowing. Posty's very much about it. asking hard questions of everything, including yourself and what you're doing and your own investments of privilege and knowledge. Whereas the Marxism had been so sure it was right. I could do that, but I didn't know how to move into this new space. How did one both write oneself into the text and question the text at the same time? What was the ground for teaching in this new space, for political practice? And I certainly wasn't the only one asking these questions. Anybody who was <coughs> dabbling or, you know, moving in these directions. By the time my first book, called Getting Smart, was published in 1991, I was teaching qualitative research at Ohio State. This was a fortuitous turn of events for me. I landed in a job that had advertised 
for a feminist critical theorist to teach qualitative research. <laughs> I call this a dream job, where what we read to teach is also what we read to do our own scholarship. And for academics, I think that's about as good as it gets. Getting Smart was completed in New Zealand while I was on Fulbright. This was an especially formative six months for me, as that part of the world gave me three powerful things. First is the awareness that no one could possibly, that one could possibly exist in a place where critical theory was the norm, because I always felt very marginal with my critical theory. And the second was to learn to defend the posty part of my feminist critical theory. Down Under was pretty well dominated by a male neo-Marxism quite wary of the French theory of the time. Habermas was much more to their liking. On the other hand, the many feminists I encountered were quite interested in the French guys and girls, and I found that interesting. Why was feminism so much more open to the intersection of postmodernism and the politics of, of, uh, of emancipation than the neo-Marxists were? The third big thing I got from this experience was what Maori politics, uh, the indigenous folks of New Zealand, Maori politics had to teach me about the ups and downs of American multiculturalism and of late indigenous methodologies of where Guy from Spivak, who's one of my academic heroes, uh, what she calls the new new of the indigenous dominant. This laid important groundwork for my engagement with the post-colonial and globalization theories of more recent times and the very contemporary turn to post-humanism, especially the Australian feminist variant that is so rooted in Aboriginal thought and practice. Here the work of Margaret Somerville, Vicki Kirby, and Elizabeth Povinelli is key. And now, almost 30 years and four books later, I look back at what developed in my research career. I more or less fell into a project on women and HIV AIDS that propelled my writing for several years and brought me back to the importance of empirical work in theorizing, which I just can't emphasize enough. I think the best theory comes out of empirical work. Um, I became part of the effort to move Ohio State's foundational studies in a cultural studies direction. Not very successful, but we worked hard at it anyway. Um, I also was part of an effort to bring post-D perspectives to AERA, which maybe has been a little more successful. Um, this was, of course, in the face of the 2002 Scientific Research and Education Report, which brought in this kind of neo-positivism that we're all living in now, which I'll speak to a little bit more later. Some of this is dealt with in my, two, my 2010 book, Engaging Social Science from the Side of the Messy. But the edge of where I'm working now is in a project I can hardly believe, given these, the history of these interests. The weight of sports on US secondary schooling. As the daughter and sister of coaches, I want to investigate the question, I call this the 6,000 pound question, in America. I don't think this is true in Canada. Do we hire teachers or do we hire coaches? And when I speak to American audiences about this, they know the answer. You know, this is bad empirical work in a way, because I know the answer before, before I do the research. But do we hire teachers or coaches? My working title is the Sports and Schooling Project, and my model is Walter Benjamin's The Arcades Project, an unfinished assemblage that explores the intersections of art, culture, history, and politics through the figure of the Paris Arcades, a precursor to shopping malls. This is my model as I stand poised on retirement's edge, hoping to produce something that will make use of all my skills and interests and contribute to how we think a different way about schools, where I can but hope that following Benjamin into my sports project is quite the right thing to do. So that's a sort of travelogue of how I've gotten to this, this point. Now I want to offer some of the charts that I've accrued over my career to make sense of this thing called qualitative research. Um, and I'll just give you this big one behind this me, or in front of you, I guess, is a better way to say it. This was one that got developed actually on that New Zealand trip, and then kept getting refined. And I want to go quickly over it. I mean, I, I spent the first five weeks of a 10 week course on this chart, so we won't, we'll be doing the quickie version here. Um, so 
I used Habermas as category. Habermas was very important in arguing that no knowledge is uninterested knowledge. Every knowledge has a human interest. And he had a book come out in 1971 called Knowledge and Human Interest. <laughs> and in that book, he said, knowledge can have an interest of predicting so that we can understand what's going on in the world, or it can have an interest of understanding what's going on in the world, or emancipating, that was his contribution. He added the emancipate, this idea that you could do legitimate academic research with an emancipatory interest and intention was very radical for the early 70s. It flew in the face of objectivity, for example. And he, Habermas helped give a language to folks who were interested in doing some of these more open advocacy kinds of research. So under each of the interests, I've got terms that you may or may not be familiar with. And in this chart, I'm kind of saying they're somewhat interchangeable. But they're, whether you're doing interpretive, naturalistic, constructivist, phenomenological, or hermeneutic research, your interest is in, you do your research to understand, not to predict. If you're doing emancipatory research, you'll see that long list there. The, the critical term is probably the one that's used the most. Then you have neo marxist feminist, practice orange, educative, race specific, fairy, participatory action research. Now, queer theory is a little debatable. Because queer theory, I would actually, if I were changing this chart now, I'd say gay and lesbian, because it's more critical. And I'd put queer over deconstruct. Because queer is different than gay and lesbian, which we could talk about or not, depending on where we wanted to go with it. I've added deconstruct as an interest. Because that's not in Habermas's vocabulary. It's in his vocabulary. He took on some poet, a series of debates, if I remember right. But he's not a friend of, of deconstruction. And under there, you've got post structural, post modern. Uh, I like the idea of post paradigmatic. I think we become over attached to our paradigms. And so the idea of post paradigmatic. And diaspora is that idea that things are opening out all over the world. And then you'll notice, and I kept it this way deliberately, pretty roughly I've added post-colonial, post-critical, which is a term under which I've done a lot of my work lately. Disability studies, I would add under that, under the deconstruction. Uh, anything that tries to uh, move into less certain, more culturally, interactive frameworks is starting to get you into the deconstruction uh, area of things. So if you just look, for example, at the difference between gay and lesbian and queer, gay and lesbian kind of act like they know what they're talking about. Like you're either you're this or you're that. They're kind of identity categories that you can hang on to. Queer is much more amorphous. Queer is, I always say it's like this to anything. Just take anything and go like that and, it's, and you queer it. So it's less sure of itself. It's invested in not being so sure of itself. Much more fluid is a kind of deconstruction. And I don't know what you know about deconstruction, but here's a very simple definition of it. Identify any set of binaries. And of course, as a feminist, I always like to work with male, female. Put the, bi the hegemonic binary on top, let's just say for the sake of argument that men have more power than women do. Then deconstruction says reverse. Put women on top and men on the bottom. Put the dominant binary term on the, bo on the top, on, on the bottom and the, the marginal one on the top. Use the energy of the reversal to go into a third space, and here's where it gets hard. Any of it, we can do that reversal, that's easy. And for them who've been on the bottom to go to the top, that's kind of fun. But the energy of the reversal to move into a third space of both and, both male and female, and neither nor. Neither male nor female. Now we moved into a, in, <laughs> into a, kind of a knowing space where we hardly know how to think outside of those binary categories. What would our lives look like? How would we do our lives 
if we didn't have the surety of those categories. And you can do that with any set of black, white, uh, old, young, any set of binary categories and see where that gets you in your thinking in very interesting ways. I do it all the time and I teach qualitative research, so I'll say objectivity, subjectivity. Objectivity is usually seen as better than subjectivity. Subjectivity is often quite derided. Reverse it. Put subjectivity on top. Live there for a little while. See what that feels like to have subjective knowledge, embodied knowledge, knowledge grounded in the affects and emotions. Have that be the knowledge that really matters. But don't stop there, because all you've done here is you've still got your operative binaries going. You're, you haven't moved into any new space. And you've got to move, this is hard, move into the third space. Objectivity, subject. You know, I, my students are mostly happy to throw objectivity out the window. And I say, you can't do that. You've got to keep objectivity and subjectivity in some kind of I don't know, I don't like the word dialogue too much, but some, certainly some relationality with each other. And intra-action, that's the new sheet term. You've got to keep objectivity and subjectivity in some intra-action with each other where they are fluid and moving and informing one another and in some ways equally respected. And then see what kind of research uh, becomes possible. So that's deconstruction. And then, uh, that's a, that map got revised. The top one? The zoo. Where's the zoo? This is one that Betty and St. Karen and I just did. Well, there's two. It doesn't matter. Just try to. I'll just sum that up. There it goes. Here it comes. Now, you'll see that there's a, a few changes to this revised. And I guess what I would say is the important thing is to note that it's revised. Things just keep getting Revised. You sort of think you've got a chart that's fairly inclusive and fairly well reflects what you're invested in. And the next thing you know, some, you read something or something happens in the world and you've got to revise. But notice under positivism, under predict, we've got neopositivists. That's what happened when the federal government in, in the United States anyway decided it was going to dictate research methods to us, especially those of us in education, kind of resurgence of the neopositivism. And you've also got mixed methods, which a lot of people think is an answer to something. But I think it's just a, a cover for positive. Because usually what you get with mixed methods is positive is research design with a few interviews thrown in. And those interviews are often quantified. Hmm. This is a shock to me. <laughs> then they go in and quantify the interviews. Under understand, you've got not too much new news. Under emancipate, not too much new news. Now Betty has inserted this break there. She says that what, ha what follows the critical is so different that actually the positivist, interpretivist, and critical are more alike than different. And that it's this break that comes with deconstruction that is the huge thing. And that's not, this was a chart, I always make my students make a chart I get it in the right direction. And I had a group of students made this chart that I think kind of captures that moment. No, that's all right. It worked, doesn't it? Yeah. They're basically, they, see, they put interpretivism, uh, positivism, and critical theory, and even deconstruction in the same box and called it hegemonic European Western. So that's their box. And then they, they said, what's outside that box? So in some ways, the idea that these are also very different from each other doesn't, doesn't sail too well either. 
But anyway, there's this, this idea that there's the break between the critical and the deconstruction, and then you got all these different kinds of posts, this and that. But notice we've added a column called next, question mark. What's coming next? Here's the post post. The new empiricism, the new materialism. Some people say a kind of citizen inquiry is what's next. And this comes out of ecology particularly, where you get folks who live in the world as kind of citizen scientists going out to collect data on pollution or whatever, a kind of citizen science. Neopragmatism, participatory dialogic policy analysis. I would now add community. I think there's different kinds of community engaged research that would fit into this post post that are having their moment. Mark, you're just going to get that moved and I'm going to. Ah, Patty. Come back and sit down. <laughs> so, so, those are just some examples of the, the different charts that I and my students have designed over the years to try to capture this thing called quality of research. And maybe I'll conclude with uh, a thousand, the idea of a thousand tiny paradigms. Instead of the idea that there's some big three or there's some big five, maybe there's a thousand tiny. And that idea actually comes from Deleuze when he was talking about sexuality. He said, we have a tendency to think you're either this or you're that. And now we've got, you know, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, Q2 or whatever it is. I always joke and say that people who run the sexuality center have to keep changing their name tag all the time because there's always something new coming down the road. But what if instead of that, the, those identifiers, there was this idea of a thousand tiny sexes, a um, thousand tiny paradigms, getting away from this idea of just so, so much proliferation that, you, that the categories break down. And you've got a kind of trouble categorization as a, as a move uh, in, in whatever it is you're doing. So I thought, I'll leave you with that idea of a thousand tiny paradigms. Maybe that's where post-qualitative research is headed. So now I want to make sure we have some time for, for Q&A. So I think it's your turn. Oh, I didn't leave one up there. I should leave one up there, shouldn't I? <laughs> That'll provoke. I'm not going to follow you. <laughs> Don't follow me. <laughs> Here, I'll put another one up there. This is one that one of my students did. I have a mic. I have a microphone. And if you have a question, I'll bring the microphone to you. <laughs> I'm always interested in how any of this maps onto your own interests and work and reading. All right, I have a question. Okay, happy. Um, in your diagram there, in the diagram of uh, uh, some of the uh, students you've worked with. I noticed that uh, there wasn't a box or a category around indigenous methodologies. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you have some thoughts on that and where it might fall within this work. I would put it out in the new, but, although it's not new, of course. But it, I think it's newly. Um, you could say newly visibilized in, 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 in mainstream uh, research methods. I was part of a conference in Oregon last summer that brought indigenous scholars together with feminists, there's phenom pragmatists, art ed folks, and there was a, oh, the positivists, excuse me. I knew there were five categories, and had us talking about what was shared and what was 
different across those five areas. Very fruitful. And I think some work will come out of that. Uh, so if I were going to put it in one of these charts, I'd put it under the, the new, new, and I'd add the caveat that it's been around for a long time. But I mean, I'm very familiar with Linda Tower Smith's work. And that is just traveling like gangbusters all over the world across all sorts of disciplinary frameworks. So I think in some ways it took a book like Linda's to sort of shoot indigenous scholarship into visibility and be picked up everywhere. Now, other questions? Yes, ma'am. Yes. To me, that could fit in somewhere between the critical and the post. -critical. I think you're exactly right. And I think that's why I like that term post-critical, because it brings the post into visibility, but it also keeps the critical there. It's not about giving up on, um, you know, why are we doing this work? We're in here because we want to change things. People, people do all the higher education, I mean, mostly, especially in education, I would say, in order to be change agents, better, better and more effective change agents. So you don't, want to, you don't want to give up on that critical. This idea, I mean, the whole thing of critical is this idea that knowledge will set us free from oppression. And you don't want to give that up. But I think there's been an awful lot of sins committed in the name of liberatory education. And I think these issues of imposition have to be looked at very, you know, again, if the idea is to turn out a bunch of students who look and sound just like us, there's something wrong with what we're doing. And so these, this post-critical, I think, foreground, that idea of asking yourself hard questions about how your liberatory intentions may actually be being experienced as oppressive. I mean, Elizabeth Al Ellis Ellsworth wrote a very famous piece in 19... Eight called Why Doesn't This Feel Empowering? And that was based on her teaching where her students kept reading critical theory and feeling not particularly empowered. They felt disempowered by the critical theory they were reading. So, you know, that's 1988. These questions have been asked at least since then. So, thank you. I'll go back here and then I'll go to Lee. Do you still have a question back here? I just like to know more about research philosophy into the civil rights movement in the states and how, how this could be um, part of, of the discovery methods into um, furthering the race relations, etc. Sure. Uh, I mean, critical race theory is sort of the bailiwick that that, I think, what you're asking about would fall under. Critical race theory is, I would put very much within a critical framework with a focus, a particular focus on race, race specific. But it's got deconstructed tendencies as well. Uh, sort of depending on who you're, who you're reading. So in a way, it's a bridge. It's a kind of, it can, it can be a kind of bridge between the critical and the, and the posty. Um, the areas particularly around the civil rights movement, I think there's an interesting, um, I don't know, rediscovery on the part of younger scholars of that moment in, in American history. I don't know if the Ferguson stuff or the, you know, the latest uh, uh, troubles with the police uh, on the American scene have fermented all of that, but there's like a rediscovery of go going back. What was I reading just the other day? There was just a fascinating re-look 
at some of the civil rights scholarship. And to a certain extent, I think what happens is that thing that happens a lot in genealogical or historical work, it's kind of a meta move, M-E-T-A. You look at how things got looked at, and that sort of becomes your whatever your research object is. It's how did this get studied? at a particular time and place. That's a very interesting move to make. Deborah Britzman did that one time. She looked at how Anne Frank got studied. How all the, there's a huge literature about Anne Frank. She looked at the, the literature and how it looked at Anne Frank. Oh, did she have some interesting things to say. So you could do that. I think there's a young generation of scholars that are starting to do that about the civil rights movement as well. And it ends up being quite a commentary on the present moment. Uh, this is how this is how we looked at it in the in the 80s and the 90s and and presently and you can see the shifts in scholarly uh, focus in a very interesting sort of way. So thank you for that question. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you for your this uh, compared to the non-microphone folks. Um, thanks for your presentation. Was, uh, I think enlightening in a number of ways. But so my question is. Thinking about pragmatic ontologies and something sort of maybe in the in the new frame. You talked a little bit about how you're sort of moving forward um, with feminist work and trying to find new ways to sort of validate that work in terms of sort of the same language that was being used in other methods, so more dominant sort of discourses. So I just wondered how so, so as you as you move in these new directions, how do you sort of negotiate the terms of validity in, in other methods of so how do I negotiate the So so I guess my question is as you as you move into this this new era, uh -huh. what do you do about the validity pieces? Do you, oh, do you have to negotiate new ways to validate that research and go back to the Ask Patrick, that's what we talked about in the drive in today. <laughs> and actually ask Mark. I just gave him an assignment. Who's that other guy? I told Ken you. Ken Montgomery. Where's that other guy? Is he here? I, He's going to come tonight, I think. Yeah, I told them to co-write a piece <laughs> on validity under conditions of the new new, you could say, or the new materialism, or the post post, because I wrote a piece in '93 and it's outdated now. It was it was called validity after post structuralism, <laughs> and I think it was pretty pertinent to the moment. But that's 20 years ago. <laughs> so now I think it's time for, it's probably not me, but some hot new scholar <laughs> <laughs> to pick that validity piece up in the contemporary uh, milieu <laughs> and have a lot of fun with it. Because validity is the crux of the matter in legitimating new perspectives and new methodologies. You've got to be able to talk a, a, a validity. You've got to have some practices. Um, and, and I would say it's not just that kind of, I mean, when I, with my own students, I used to say, you're going to get into your defense, and somebody's going to ask you, how do I know this is valid work? You better have something to say. And oftentimes, at, in those days, you had a, a cross-paradigm committee. And the positivist folks were particularly interested in making sure you could talk that talk. One of the things I learned was they didn't care what you said. As long as you had validity, talk, and practices, and you could wrap that wrap, they'd sign. Now that's a kind of legitimation factor that I'm actually less concerned about than I am about. I think rigorous validity practices help you do better work. That's where I really care about it. I think if you've got, you know, like the concept of member checks that came out of Uba and Lincoln's early work, this idea that you owe it to the people you're doing research with to let them see what you wrote about them. I mean, as radical as that is, how can you just go write about people and then they don't even know what you wrote about them? That's not ethical. Because the other thing that started happening was that ethics and validity practices started bleeding into each other. And if you're doing ethical research, you're, you've got a better claim to doing valid research, and vice versa as well. So thank you. That, as you can see, that's a button for me. <laughs> I'm always, uh, always interested in new work on validity. Hi.
Hi guys. Hello? You there? Uh, listen, I, I uh, read your work for a long time, and I guess one of the things that always puzzled me was why you you stuck with the the, the fast to the notion of validity. Mm -hmm. when so many were writing about this notion that I guess Cynthia Dillard uh, speaks to me when she when she says if you're going to change the, if you change the music you need to change the dance. Mm -hmm. And I guess one I wonder why. Uh, a colleague of ours who just, who's retired several years now um, was asked, I think, in a lecture that she gave in the faculty um, when she was doing a study of grade six girls in a Saskatchewan school uh, about uh, validity. And she looked at him and said, um, I'm not interested in validity. Oh, well, that's a discourse from another paradigm. Uh -huh, mm -hmm. Exactly. And so when the paradigm changes, um, you had some very creative adjectives for validity when you wrote that paper. And I was fascinated by it, you know, voluptuous validity and rhizomatic. That's always the favorite, yes. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But it seems to me that, you know, when the dance, when the post structural uh, notions and when the theory came along, mm -hmm. it seemed like it, we needed to change the language mm -hmm. in order to the discourse change, mm -hmm. the language needed to change. And I was always interested and fascinated about why we why sort of stuck to that, to that uh, concept of validity when, in fact, now AERA has two separate sets of guidelines. One Thank for, you very much. Yes. Yeah, yeah. One for quantitative, one for qualitative. Mm -hmm. And some of those concepts, those, those criteria of legitimation mm -hmm. apply to one and not necessarily mm -hmm. the other, but all of these other good terms that we have now for criteria that look at quality, plausibility, credibility, authenticity, and those kinds of words have just as much credibility in my mind as the, as validity, as the, as validity yeah. does for quantitative research. Yeah. It's, a, it's a statistical concept. That's how I think. Historically, it certainly came out of positivism. I always argued it was too important of a term to let them have. <laughs> that uh, it's a little bit like now we're fighting about what is evidence. Well, I don't want them, and I don't mean I'm really not this binary of a person. I'm actually very interested in cultural studies of quantitative quantification right now. So I'm trying to build my own bridges. But there was a there was this idea that somehow they have evidence and we just have feelings or something. And, and I, so I thought it was very important that this concept of evidence be blown up in a way and reimagined uh, so that qualitative folks could claim evidentiary warrant as well. You can make a different argument for evidence. Yeah, there's already more claim to that. But data, I mean, when I gave, I gave one of my positive colleagues my Women in AIDS book, and it's all narrative. It's like, I don't know, 300 pages of narrative. And at the very end, there's about five pages of demographic numbers. And he picked that book up, and he went right to there. And he said, oh, you do have some data in here. And I thought. Now this guy needs to be educated. You know, I said that other 300 pages are data too. So sometimes the only way, and you know, who's your audience? Is positive is my, my audience? Sometimes in order to make a, a legitimate space for these alternative practices, you gotta, you've got to grab those central terms and not let them go. I think that was my thinking. Well, people like you have a lot of courage for, for uh, going against the dominant discourse you know, I've been told that before. It didn't feel particularly courageous. It was about being able to breathe myself. You know, if I was going to have an academic career, I had to make the, I had, and I always felt like I was part of a group. You know, I wasn't doing this by myself. We, we, there was a we involved here. We were making spaces where we could breathe and live in the academy and flourish. And that was very motivating. So you young ones, I'm curious what your 
motivators would be. I mean, there's, there's always work to be done, but I think each generation has a different sense of what its work is. You know, what it's, what's the dominant? I've worked with students of color who are fighting the dominance of the posties. They feel like the ground got, got, they were just getting going with a kind of critical race uh, thing and then, and then here comes the posties interrupting identity politics and jerking the rug from underneath them and so they feel like their fight <laughs> is against deconstruction. So, you know, what's your generation's struggle? Depending on your positionality in terms of identities and, and investments of privilege and struggle, I always keep coming back to that phrase. So, think about that. We've got a couple more minutes if somebody has a quick question. <laughs> I was just interested when you're talking about binaries, if you could even just give some quick examples or your thoughts on what do you think, if we're sort of looking at a fundamental shift of how we do school, mm. what would some of the sort of most important or most interesting binaries to look at? What would you think in opinion? In sort of traditional ways of schooling? Right. Versus what might be coming down the road? Right. Mm. Well, I mean, one very basic one would be where what, where is school? <laughs> school is a building versus not, not a building. Um, how diffuse is all that going to get? And what is all this media technology going to mean in terms of where is school? And I'm not a great believer in these online schools. From what I can see, they're a sham. And so whatever it is we're doing in those directions right now are, are no models that I've been able to get my hands on. But I think, I think the world is exploding through the web. And I think if we can figure out how to help kids learn better and navigate it better and use it to, to learn better, it's going to change a lot. I think another binary is who's a teacher? <laughs> here's a teacher, here's not a teacher. I think that, you know, whatever these um, ideas are about getting kids out in the community, learning from communities, folks in the communities, uh, de binarying our here's a teacher with a certified whatever. And th this is what, our, what we have to have our kids spend most of their time with, who uh, that could be an interesting binary to play with. I also think kids, we vastly underestimate what kids can learn from each other. If it could be channeled better, I mean, it's not, your peer culture has its problems, God knows. <laughs> but the idea of having the older kids teach the younger kids, for example, I mean, this is going, in a way, it's going back to the one-room schoolhouse, uh, where, where kids learn to, to provide service in learning to younger children. Um, things like that. Nothing too exotic, but... Um. Um, I'm going to uh, end it here with <laughs> the question. Q&A part. Um, I just want to thank uh, Patty for coming here and sharing her, uh, her uh, wisdom, her insights, and her knowledge. And thank her for engaging me in a conversation about imminent validity as I was trying to negotiate the bad roads here. <laughs> so uh, it, 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 it was really wonderful listening to you share, and I wish we had more time for mm. you to share more. Oh, yeah. But if everybody could. Uh, Thank you. And a thanks to you too for coming out. <laughs>